Um, why 30 years? Well, one, we thought uh, we need a title, and we thought, well, either we wait until 2011, or we get in sneak in early. So we decided to sneak in early. Uh, we could have done both. I suspect in a couple of years' time we'll have uh, 30 years as well, by the way. So, so uh, it's just an excuse, uh, really, to look at the background of um, our present organisation and really where it's going. Why 1979? Well, in order to tell you why 1979, I really need to tell you something about where I was and where uh, the movement was uh, in, that, in that period. I'm definitely not going to take you on, on a memory uh, trip. I'm not going to um, get all sentimental and revisit my past or be pleased to hear, although there will be a little bit of that, I'm afraid, uh, to begin with, just to put the thing uh, in context. I joined uh, the Young Communist League in 1969 uh, I think I was something like, I can't remember, but 14, 15, or something like that, uh, years old. I'd applied, I'd applied, what? No, I'm not quite sure of that. Uh, I'd applied to join the previous year uh, because people at my school knew I was a communist, and somebody from the Young Communist League was giving out leaflets out the front, front gate of the school. I tended to go home jumping over the wire. Uh, to save myself time, but they gave me the leaflet, said, John, you'll be interested in this, look, it's the communists. I, I wrote off and I sent off 50 pence uh, donation to the Vietnamese out there fighting uh, the Americans, and I heard nothing uh, after. I thought, oh, I can't be good enough, or anything. but anyway, I think it was because the branch had just collapsed. Um, I think there'd been a, a split. Uh, with most comrades becoming Maoists at the time. But a year after I joined, and um, I'd not come from a political background, uh, this wasn't in the period of the internet. I certainly was, as I say, given how old I was, poor. Um, so the literature I had available to me was extraordinarily uh, limited. I think I'd managed to get hold of a copy of the Communist Manifesto with an introduction by A.J.P. Taylor. I can't say I was able to make that much uh, of it, because you didn't have anyone to ask. Right? And I remember looking up in my mum's big fat dictionary what a bourgeois was. It didn't really help me, I, except I was against them. I didn't know much more about it than that. Right? But yes, when I joined the Young Communist League, then I started to become educated. It was not much of an education, uh, but it was an education. I also discovered, uh, more or less on day one when I joined the Young Communist League, that I disagreed uh, with the Young Communist League. I found myself, almost from day one, uh, being an oppositionist, because I knew what I wanted uh, as a young man. I wanted to overthrow all the existing conditions. I was angry. I was part of a generation uh, that was growing up in the 50s, growing up into the 60s, and was being influenced by what was going on around me and what was going on in the world. And what was going on, you can describe, I suppose, in one word, and that is change. Change. That is what was going on. Everywhere, as far as I could see on the news, there was rebellion. Everywhere, uh, in every aspect of society, people were challenging uh, the old order. It's very difficult, I think, nowadays to get your head around it. If I was going to recommend uh, a cultural education in the 1960s, I wouldn't recommend a film like If, uh, or, or a film about flower power, or Easy Rider, I don't know if that was in the 60s, but that's the type of film. I'd actually recommend you watch back-to-back -back editions of On the Buses. Now, you wouldn't know uh, On the Buses. <laughs> that was the 1960s in reality. I don't know if anyone's watched, watched an edition of it. It was a terrible time. It was not a time uh, of great experimentation, but there was rebellion against that. Right? That's the point uh, to grasp. Anyway. To cut that uh, story short, the organisation I joined, as I said before, was the Young Communist League. It was the youth wing uh, of the CPGB, which as you know was uh, attached uh, to the World Communist Movement and was loyal uh, to the Soviet Union 
uh, to the powers uh, in Moscow. The Young Communist League at the time, I think, would have had roughly two to three thousand uh, members. Roughly speaking, the CPGB would have had something like ten times uh, uh, that number. So, roughly speaking, uh, about thirty thousand. The reality was of that organisation that the vast majority of those people were inactive. Most of them uh, were paper members. Nevertheless, uh, certainly when you look at the CPGB, it wasn't an empty organisation. It wasn't a, just an organisation of uh, card-carrying uh, members who didn't do anything. If you take the active members, uh, anything that was going on in your local town had the Communist Party uh, either in a very influential position or in a leading uh, position. Ditto when it came uh, to industry. So, for example, uh, the branch that I joined um, of the CPGB not only had uh, a town branch, it had industrial uh, uh, branches. Right? It led, of course, uh, uh, the Trades Council. Uh, when uh, the government came in with this thing called fair rents, which basically of course means higher rents, uh, the Communist Party was responsible for organising every area uh, of my town in terms of rent strikes. Right? When it came to campaigning for the local hospital, it was the Secretary of the Communist Party that was leading that campaign. When, for example, uh, Ted Heath locked up the five dockers in 1972, it was the Communist Party that brought workers out on strike from engineering plants and building uh, sites. It was the Communist Party uh, that, on, at a local level uh, that led uh, uh, that campaign. So as I say, while you did have uh, large numbers of people being inactive, uh, you also saw that this actually was a real part of the working class. It wasn't uh, a sect that simply talked uh, to each other, it was a part of the class that was able, able in that sense to move and activate uh, and direct the class. And while that had definite benefits, as I alluded to uh, before, uh, it also had uh, distinct disadvantages. Because the reason I found myself in opposition was I discovered that the programme uh, of uh, the Communist Party the outlook uh, of the Communist Party was really wedded to the Labour Party. It was wedded to the idea of the Communist Party being a ginger group uh, on the Labour Party and basically pursuing uh, what was called um, a parliamentary uh, road uh, to socialism. Not only a parliamentary road to socialism, but in essence a status and peaceful uh, road uh, uh, to socialism. And of course by socialism, uh, what they meant was a nationalisation of uh, the means of production um, and the expropriation uh, of uh, the capitalist class. It's true uh, that they talked about uh, democracy, but in essence what you were talking about is leaving the existing state more or less uh, intact. In other words, if you looked at the army uh, or you looked at the bureaucracy, the idea was uh, that if the bourgeoisie can use these institutions, so can we. Uh, that the army will remain loyal uh, to the constitution uh, because it's a constitutional uh, army. That was the idea, and that is certainly something, even with my limited reading uh, of Marxism, um, uh, I uh, disagreed with, uh, I rejected. And of course, I wasn't alone. Uh, the Communist Party, although it had the image uh, to many in terms of its history, certainly by the early uh, um, 70s, uh, was riven with factions. Um, I'm not going to tell you all uh, the factions, but I think it would be useful just to outline a couple uh, uh, of them. There was the Marxism Today faction. I don't know if anyone heard my comments to Hillel about Martin Jakes, the editor. Uh, of uh, Marx and today. I mean, he was uh, someone who delighted uh, later on in putting police chiefs on the front of uh, his, his journal, interviewing bishops. Uh, that was his version uh, of communist politics. He, he wanted to upset the left, he wanted to, to delight the right. Uh, the Guardian, the bourgeoisie, loved him. 
he was their sort of communist. Um, in the Communist Party, uh, that faction was quite widespread. It certainly had representatives on the leadership of the CPGB. You could describe the other uh, leading faction as uh, the right revisionists, as we later called them. For shorthand purposes, you could describe them today, I suppose, as the Morning Star uh, faction. You know, uh, the paper that goes back to the Daily Worker uh, uh, of the 1940s and the 1930s. But there were others too. Um, and I certainly was, uh, I found myself sort of uh, orbiting loosely uh, around a faction that was basically led, how should you put it, by what uh, they called Surrey District, which is basically South London uh, District. In the Communist Party, unlike the SWP, um, members had the right to elect their district officials, which meant that in broad terms, uh, these officials ran a feudal type, I mean, I'm saying this in inverted commas, a feudal type um, situation. So you, you found yourself in a situation, not only was the party divided according to factions at the top, it was also divided into factions depending on where you lived. If you were a Euro communist and happened to be living in Surrey district, it was not a very pleasant experience. You certainly wouldn't have found your way onto the Surrey district committee. You would have been excluded. If you take uh, um, that district, it was operating in coordination with other fellow thinkers, and that included a guy called Fergus Nicholson. I don't know what the hell Fergus Nicholson is doing nowadays, but in the 60s and 70s, he was student organizer uh, of the CPGB. And I've tried to look him up in terms of his publication. It was called Straight Left. Um, I don't know if anyone visited Houseman's recently and does anyone know whether it's still going? I've tried to look it up on the web and found no results, but that really wouldn't surprise me. But he used to write under the name of um, Harry Still. Does anyone want to guess where that name might originate uh, from? Stan, it's too easy for you, but... Because uh, you know. But I mean, Still? Harry <laughs> Still. No! Stalin! Stalin, the man of steel, Stalin. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's it's in Russian. Yeah? Yeah. Harry comes from Harry Pollitt, exactly. Put the two names. There is another Harry still, by the way, yes, as Alan says, on the web now. That is taken from that. The original Harry still is Fergus Nicholson. And straight left, uh, it's a bit like, uh, I think there was a comrade who was um, in militant that was talking, me, talking to me a couple of days ago about the attitude of um, militant uh, to women, homosexuals, and other deviants. Was it you? <laughs> it was you then, there you are, Danny. Yeah. Uh, straight left was called straight left because it wasn't wanting anything to do with this deviation. It didn't want anything to do with homosexuals, it didn't want anything to do with this nanny bandy women stuff. We are straight left. Ah. <laughs> right. But it was pro-Moscow. Right? It was Harry still, you know, that's the idea. Okay, uh, for my sins, and I coming here, as I say, uh, not to do a memory tour in terms of all the happy uh, side of it, but yes, that was the faction uh, I was attracted uh, uh, to. Uh, in terms of my town, I ended up uh, having comrades around me, and in 19... 77, I won't go into the ins and outs of it, I joined an organisation called the New Communist Party, which was like a, a split in the opposition from, um, within the opposition that split away and formed a separate party. The long and the short of it was, is the leadership were going to expel or discipline Surrey District, and they broke prematurely. They, they said, well, rather than be disciplined, we're going to break, and they formed the New Communist Party. Uh, I, absolutely to my amazement, I was approached and said, John, we want you on the Central Committee. Um, I thought they must have been mad, right, because uh, I was simply a local um, organiser. Uh, that was my, um, you know, that was about the limits of my uh, experience. Um, <clears throat> so I thought, Jesus Christ, why on earth do they want someone like me? to go along to their central committee. I turned up to my first central committee and went, oh my God, 
the level, the political level, was just appalling. And the reason why the political level was so appalling, in my view, is because all the struggles conducted uh, by those who disagreed with the leadership was, con was conducted in a clandestine way. All of it was conducted on the basis of organisational manoeuvring. All of it was about positions. And in that sense, it's, it's more reminiscent of a Labour Party, of where if you go along to a ward meeting or you go along to a constituency meeting, you're not, surprisingly enough, in a political party talking about politics. You're not talking about what latest world events. You might talk about that in the pub afterwards, but in your formal meetings, what you're talking about is who's going to serve on what committee. How can you replace this faction member with one of your own faction members? How do you ensure that your delegation to the National Congress is going to be 100% ours? That was what the politics consisted of. And what they knew in the opposition is they were against them there, there. So in terms of uh, what used to be called King Street, which is in, I think it's actually in Bedford Street, I won't go into it, but you can go to Covent Garden and look at the old CPGB headquarters. Apparently it was the first building, I think, in London to have bulletproof um, thick glass all the way around it because someone took a submachine gun to it. But they knew they were against them, right? So the, the attitude of the opposition was, what are they saying this week? We're against it. Uh, it was quite easy to operate uh, those sort of politics. But when you're an independent political organisation with your weekly paper and with your central committee and you haven't got the leadership to rebel against and you haven't got this faction to manoeuvre against, what have you got to say? And the reality of the NCP uh, central committee is actually what they were talking was, to use a, a, a phrase, they were talking shite. Uh, they had nothing to say. They knew uh, that they were in favour of Moscow. Uh, they knew that that was uh, the right way forward. But other than that, they really did not have a clue. So, for example, you could ask the General Secretary of the NCP, who was a nice guy uh, called Sid French, Sid, what do you think about Soviets? Ha, ha, ha. Can you imagine Soviets in Surrey? Well, what's our road forward then? Well, we've got to get into the Labour Party. Well, why aren't we in the Labour Party? Because they won't let us in uh, to the Labour Party. What do we do in the meantime? I don't know. I mean, that was more or less uh, it. Now, Sid French, as I say, I mean, I, he might have been a bastard eventually, uh, but I mean, in terms of my relationship with him, I, I was always friendly with him, but he died. So, Almost as soon as he's founded this organisation, he killed over. And I can remember travelling back, I was um, speaking, I think, in Colchester or somewhere like that, and picking up the paper, and there in the Guardian, Sid French. I thought, oh, jeez, you know, nice, nice guy, and what now? He's a leader of the organisation. What happened was the national organiser steps up, a guy called Eric Trevitt, becomes General Secretary, and bizarrely, again, I get a phone call, John, we want you to be national organiser. <laughs> what? Are these people mad? Well, I think they were mad, as it, as it turned out. Um, okay, I became national organiser. Um, I pity Jim isn't here. I did my first national tour. Um, I get on a bus, I had a copy of Eurocoglu's um, Weakling, I read it, it's a, a book by a member of the TKP. I thought, this is really good, this is one of the first decent Marxist books I've read from the official communist movement ever. So I was reading that, anyway, that's a story that uh, is, is yet to come. Turkey weak link of imperialism. But I got up to Yorkshire and uh, as national organiser I found the situation rather unsatisfactory as we knew it was going to be. I.e. none of the branches were meeting you had a, a district committee meeting that would consist of 30 people. So they would meet in Leeds or Sheffield or wherever it happens to be uh, as the district committee, but none of the branches were operating. I suggested that what we should do is reduce the size of the district committee drastically and let's have local meetings actually in the branches. That's what I agreed with Eric Trevor, the general secretary, before I went up on tour. I had a big battle, Jim Moody supported me, I think he was district secretary up there. 
we, we beat off the opposition in the district committee. I, I spoke at all the branches uh, in terms of individuals on the rest of it, went back home, and uh, the decision had been reversed. Right. Eric Trevitt had had a phone call with somebody on the old district committee, don't like this reorganisation, even though he had a vote, uh, it's reversed. Anyway, that was the nature of that organisation. It was a conservative organisation. It was an organisation that actually did not want to do anything. It was an organisation that was incapable of doing anything. What do I do? Uh, I had um, co-thinkers. Uh, I had one co-thinker in particular, and what we decided to do uh, was to say, basically, look, we don't know what the hell we're talking about. We actually do not have any ideas. Quite clearly, where we've come from is a bankrupt political tradition. What we actually need to do is to take a step back uh, from politics, to study uh, politics, basically, to study theory, and as an exercise, what we'll do is write an equivalent of Britain weak link uh, of imperialism. We'll write something substantial uh, in order to work out not only where we've come from, uh, but where we want uh, to go, because where we are at the present time is quite clearly uh, bankrupt and a complete waste of time. We were in contact uh, with the Communist Party of Turkey uh, for reasons I explained to Lars over on Hampstead Heath, long and laboriously. I you know, sorry about that, Lars. The situation in Britain was that um, one of its larger districts, this is an illegal organization uh, in Turkey, and I think it's been illegal since more or less its, its foundations. In terms of uh, the TKP, uh, it revived in the late 60s. It had one of its larger organizations uh, in Britain. The leader of that organization was called uh, Eurokoglu, and the long and the short of it is that either he was expelled or broke away, whatever it was, he forms an organization called TKP Brackets Ishan and Sesi, that means Workers' Voice uh, in Turkey. These people, in our view, uh, at the time, were very impressive. Uh, they were fantastically organized, fantastically productive in terms of literature. We had a meeting with them, that's myself and uh, a comrade called uh, Robin uh, Jackson, who wrote in our paper under the name Frank uh, Grafton. We had a meeting uh, with the leadership of the TKP, and uh, the comrades turned around to me and said, John, look, you've taken not just yourself uh, into this silly organization called the NCP, you've taken a lot of other comrades. Don't you think you owe a duty uh, to these comrades, not just to dump them and uh, leave them behind while you get on and think big thoughts. And I thought to myself, well, I suppose that's true. Uh, so the, the Communist said, well, why don't you actually join uh, the Communist Party of Turkey? I thought, well, look, <laughs> we've got a revolutionary situation, uh, they said, and it's sort of, you know, Turkey was happening uh, at the time. I mean, in Turkey at the time, uh, Istanbul would have a May Day demonstration of a million, right, a million people. Uh, with red flags and uh, uh, unions such as DISC, the Revolutionary Trade Union uh, Centre. Uh, there were gun battles uh, uh, in the street. This was a country uh, that was extraordinarily unstable, where the left was rapidly uh, growing, where the left was incredibly uh, influential. So we thought about it and said yes. Um, again, such is life. Um, almost as soon as we'd said yes, I think it was the colonels, call them the colonels, the generals, but there was a coup. And uh, the comrades end up being arrested, rounded up, in prison, in exile, and my job goes from taking part in a revolution in Turkey, trying to understand Turkish and going there sort of tied by there, participating in the revolution, maybe being in a modest way, sort of John Reed uh, for Britain, you know, noting things down and inspiring. Uh, Britain with these events, to running a solidarity organization really with comrades in prison. I mean, that was really uh, it. Okay, but we didn't just go into the TKP. The deal was that if we did conduct a struggle in the NCP, it would be as short as possible because we cannot be bothered. Right? We did not want to conduct a long struggle, so we agreed that it would be a, a short, sharp struggle uh, with the aim of getting as many people expelled and out of it as quickly as possible. But what we said to the Commons is we don't want to just join 
the TKP, we are quite clearly British, you know, you're not going to make us into Turks ever, it's an impossibility. We will meet as the British, British section, and we have this project of going back uh, into the CPGB to fight for what we then viewed, or what we were groping towards, what we, what we thought of, as a correct political line. Not with the view that we ever thought we could win it. We'd been in that organisation, we knew how it worked, we knew that a Congress victory in such an organisation was impossible, but because we had experience of this organisation being part of the class, this was not just some sect. If we set up our sect, there's no way uh, we could turn ourselves into a party. We said that we have to be in the CPGB, not because we had any illusions about its history, not because we had any illusions about its democracy, but because we thought there was the human raw material in that that could be made into a genuine communist party. That happened in 1979. That's why we've got the 30 uh, years in terms of the title. We left uh, the TKP um, in 1980. I think I was a member uh, for a year of the TKP. And the reason I left, well, I, or, or I was um, pushed out, uh, is because we actually took this project seriously. Uh, not only were we meeting, we were planning a publication. And the publication was becoming nearer and nearer. We were collecting material for an art articles. Quite clearly, we were serious about this project, right? This is what we were going to do. Um, what happened in terms of uh, the people I had around me, it didn't surprise me. I think I split uh, from the NCP. Uh, we had a very brief struggle, something like 30 or 40 people. Uh, we controlled the youth wing. We published something called The Young Worker. Um, I was assured by my um, TKP comrade, a comrade called Bedir, that you're going to get it spelled for this front page. I said, you must be joking. Uh, he was right. We published a young worker with a headline saying, if you want peace, fight the bosses. Can you imagine? <laughs> Can you imagine? Right? This really should get you into the idea of what popular frontism is actually all about. Right? If you want peace, fight the bosses. I mean, come on. I mean, you might want to expel me for rightism. You might want to expel me for anything. But I was expelled, of course, uh, for leftism, because this is class struggle. We can't have any of this. What we want is the CND. What we want is peace committees with vicars. That was the view uh, of the NCP. But not to my surprise, uh, other people very quickly uh, found reasons to leave. As I say, I had about 30 or 40 people around me. Most people in most splits want out. Most people in most splits want out with honour. Right? That's my uh, experience. So they look to someone and they say, I don't like where I am, you're giving them a way out. Uh, so it really didn't surprise me uh, that after literally a few months, we were down to something like six people. But we were members of the Communist Party of Turkey, we had comrades in the illegal section, obviously, because there had been a coup. We had comrades going to airports and Istanbul, smuggling this, that or the other. Um, sort of boasting now. But, uh, I and uh, another comrade, we actually smuggled uh, a printing press uh, uh, into Turkey uh, in a van. I remember I tell you about that over beer, but <laughs> we were useful because if you were a Turk going into Turkey, you'll be searched by the police. Um, you know, British people, when I arrived over the border on Turkey, having been put through real shit by the Bulgarian police, we arrived in Turkey in this rickety van that's going... <laughs> Turkish um, officer calls <coughs> us on the motorway and goes, oh, shit, it's a Electrodes and what's it? Is it, is it Midnight Express? You know, so, oh God, I don't fancy that. Stopped us, we wind down the window, and he says, Welcome to Turkey! <laughs> because coup meant no tourists, tourists good, and uh, anyway. 
So we were useful. British passports got you through. British people were not suspected, and that's where our comrades were. Later, Mark will tell you some of our comrades were real experts on clandestine struggles. For example, never had meetings near watermelon sellers. Yet, the comrade actually did give a lecture starting off with that very useful piece of information. Apparently in Turkey, watermelon sellers, because they walk around the streets, are used as low level, at least that's my knowledge, low level spies by the police. What use that is in Britain for us, I do not know. So some of our comrades, as you put it, absorbed more useful information uh, than others. Anyway, after two years of uh, meeting twice a week, it's the schedule we put, and working on articles and working on theoretical questions, we published uh, the Leninist number one. We knew uh, that years later, maybe even a few years later, we would look back at that number one and be rather embarrassed uh, by it. But we were determined in our two years of study to be as little embarrassed as possible. In other words, we took our study seriously, right? We took our theory seriously. We were going to be a serious organization. We weren't putting ourselves forward merely as a sect. We were putting ourselves forward as leaders. And on that basis, we basically said to comrades, you must make yourself full-time, right? You must make yourself full-time revolutions, because if you don't, uh, others won't. That's the sort of standard uh, uh, we uh, set ourselves. The crucial question about the Leninists, though, was that where there had been other oppositionist publications pretending to be something else, the Leninist was completely open. If you take straight left, we, I always remember an argument, I don't know what they were called at the time, but socialist organizer, the AWL uh, of now, they actually did a review of left factions in the Labour Party. Uh, a little book by Stan Crook. Anyway, I think that was his name. Anyway, he did a little paragraph. I think, I did, did you review it or was it some other comrade? Whoever reviewed it looked at this paragraph and said bollocks. Straight left, a faction of the Labour Party. No comrades, it's a faction of the CPGB. Don't you understand? And he actually wrote back to us, he got this stupid argument, no, you don't really talk about, you're encouraging Kinnock's purge, and, uh, well, straight left was written by, as I say, Fergus Nicholson, it was a CPGB faction, but it wasn't surprising that people on the Labour left could mistake it for a bit of a weird Labour left publication. In other words, it had nothing about the CPGB. The Leninist was utterly different. What the Leninist said is, here you are, this is what the CPGB looks like, right? We are lifting a stone, we're showing the entire public the factional workings, the bureaucracy, who thinks what about what in the CPGB. We're going to be perfectly open about our own ideas, and we're going to be as open as possible about who thinks what in the CPGB. Whereas most comrades on the left believe that CPGB is organized in terms of a faction called the Tankies and another faction called the Euros, it's a lot more complex than that. This is actually how it really is, that these factions are divided, they don't all think what you think, they think they think this. Right? Not only that, we will publish our own differences if we have them openly. This is an open publication, this is an open rebellion against opportunism. We are for revolution, we are for Marxism, and we chose the name Leninist simply because, as uh, Jean-Michel and other French comrades will know at the time, in order to move themselves to the right, various Euro-communists were trying to get rid of the word Leninist. Uh, so we took that as a badge of honor. Uh, we said we are Leninists, we stand in the tradition of the October Revolution uh, and the Bolshevik Party. Now, as I said, in many ways, we recognized uh, that we were extremely in inexperienced. Uh, and in a, in a real way, writing for the Leninist, publishing uh, the Leninist, uh, was about our self-development. Uh, that was an extremely important part uh, of uh, that uh, project.
Yeah, sure. Okay. Let's just go through some of our ideas and how they uh, developed. I suppose the... I didn't know it was that point. <laughs> <laughs> I, suppose, I suppose our starting point would have been taking hold of uh, the programme uh, of the official CPGB, which was being redrafted um, um, in this uh, period. Uh, the programme was called the British Road to Socialism. I think the CPB, which is the Morning Stars Party at the present time, have rechristened it, haven't they? Uh, Brit Britain's Road to Socialism. What the difference is, I don't know. But this is a document uh, that goes back in terms of its real prehistory, I suppose, to the 1930s. Uh, you could go back to the mid-30s and find the origins of this. I think they produced a draft just before World War II um, in 1939. That became irrelevant in 1939. Uh, they produced a draft again in 1950, and I think it became the party program in 1951. And as with most official communist documents, it was of a peculiar sort, uh, because it would tell you uh, what was going on six months ago. And it would give great detail about who was in the government and what they were doing and why they represented a danger and how many workers were angry about this and what we're going to do immediately. And that's why uh, almost as soon as they came off the press, uh, they had to be reprinted. But it would be wrong to simply dismiss that document uh, as um, equivalent of a, a popular pamphlet. Because if you look at the British Road to Socialism, in terms of the strategy that it mapped out for gaining socialism in Britain, it was not only the programme in that sense of the CPGB, it was also the programme of the left of the trade union movement and therefore also the left of the Labour Party. Right? If you think about the Labour Party in those days, yes, you had a Communist Party which was going down in numbers, but in a real sense, if you take uh, a group in the Labour Party that used to be called the Tribune Group, which would have had, I don't know, 30 MPs, 40 MPs, maybe even 50 MPs, without saying there was a direct correspondence between uh, them and the Communist Party, in essence, the Communist Party did their thinking for them. But that was the basic relationship. And if you take the left of the trade union movement, that also went for them as well. So it wasn't just the CPGB that looked to get socialism through Parliament and use the British Army and get rid of the House of Lords and reform things in order to nationalise the means of production. It was the Labour left, it was the left of the trade union movement too. And also you need to recognise that this programme, although it's got the name British at the front of it, had definite, and we know that, we, we always sort of knew it, but it's been proved now, it had the fingerprints of J.V. Stalin all over it. Not only in terms of its theoretical origins, which quite clearly, as I've illustrated over the peace question, go back to 1935, the 7th Congress of Comintern, Georgi Dimitrov, who said against fascism, we've got to unite with the progressive bourgeoisie, not only on the streets, but in government. Uh, that's where the British road to socialism comes from, theoretically. But in the 1950s, in the early 1950s, Harry Pollitt, the general secretary that I mentioned of the, the Communist Party, travels to Moscow, has a meeting with the great man, uh, J Joseph Stalin himself, and he says, right, about the program, Harry, this is how you've got to do it. And how about this change and that change? How about making it a bit more patriotic? How about making making it a bit more British and a bit less Russian? Um, not quite, yes sir, but yes sir, <laughs> right? That's what happened. We've got the documentary evidence. In other words, if you pick up the British Road to Socialism, this isn't just a British document. It's also, in that sense, uh, a Moscow document, and this was copied around the world. Remember Trotsky's remarks when he heard Stalin come out with this idea of socialism in one country. He made a brilliant prediction. He said, it might be 
socialism in one country called Russia, but it will not be long before the various sections of Comintern, the various sections of the Communist International, start producing their own national roads to socialism themselves. What's wrong with this idea, you might say? Socialism is fundamentally international. It's about, oh, it's about superseding capitalism. Right? Capitalism does not exist fundamentally on a national throne. Fundamentally, capitalism is a global system. How can you separate right, a bit of capitalism off and expect to have anything other than disaster? We've spoken earlier uh, in the week with Sandy. Sandy described the Scottish Socialist Party. These people are meant to come from a Trotskyist background, talking about a Scottish socialism. It's meant to have a very long coastline. Just imagine the situation in Scotland of Tommy Sheridan becoming Prime Minister of Scotland, nationalising uh, the banks, nationalising the industries, taking the oil. What would happen to Scotland? I don't know how long you give it, Sandy. There you are. <laughs> Some people might say that's being generous, but I go with you, exactly. It's, it's, a, it's a form of madness. Either it's just straightforward reformism, if it's a serious program in Marxist terms, it does not make sense. But Trotsky predicted with absolute accuracy, not in terms of dates, but this will actually infect the whole of Comintern. And what that logically leads to is not just colouring uh, your red banner with the patriotic colours of your nation. Ultimately, it must mean straightforward nationalism. Right? Nationalism goes from being something you pose to something you are. And certainly if you look at the Euro communists, uh, people like Martin, Jakes, Marxism, if you look at the French Communist Party, if you look at the Italian Communist Party, these people were not putting on a show. They were the real thing. These people were tied to the nation state. They've become, to use a phrase, I know it upsets some people, but it's a right phrase, they've become national socialists. Not of the Nazi sort, right, but of the left-wing sort. That's actually the right name uh, to call them. Anyway, we engaged in a criticism, a discussion, a critique of the British road to socialism, and the results uh, can be seen today uh, in the book Which Road, which comes as a result. I think that's the, the third critique or the third edition uh, of it, not in book form, but it's the third development of it. From our point of view, the central question in terms of the fight in the CPGB wasn't about how many recruits we made, it certainly wasn't about how many branches we seized, it wasn't about how many uh, Congress delegates uh, we obtained, it was program. That was the crucial question we recognised. And to develop a program, what we said is we should begin with a critique of the best that there is. That might not be saying much, but the British Road of Socialism is certainly far superior to anything else that the left had produced, and within it uh, there was world history. Right? So that was the purpose uh, of our critique. And in order to do that, what we did is not just pick up the British Road to Socialism, uh, we studied Lenin, we studied Marx, we studied Engels, and also, and I know it's been disputed uh, by one correspondent um, in the weekly work, we also studied uh, Trotsky. Um, I can recall going to a comrade who used to be uh, around us, who was in the TKP, Max Harans, who ran a bookshop in uh, Morning Lane, selling Marx, Engels and Lenin to the locals. Actually, most of the locals bought, um, what's the name of the romantic books? Um, <laughs> Mills and Boone and other such books. Anyway, I bought uh, everything uh, of Leon Trotsky uh, that I could uh, obtain. We uh, were at the time, and I, I remain critical of Trotsky. I mean, I think, it, it, you know, if I sat down with Alan uh, and he said, join the IDT, I suspect I'd be required to accept or agree, I'm not quite sure, um, the transitional program. I suspect I'd have to accept or agree uh, the idea that Russia was a degenerate worker state. I don't know, I'm only just guessing. I don't want to force anybody to say any of these things. Uh, and I can carry on down the list. Permanent revolution might be also uh, a requirement. I've always been 
critical of uh, Trotsky. Um, but I think if you look at our, our writings, I can also guarantee you uh, that Trotsky was inspiring us as well. Trotsky actually gave us a mirror uh, on what the reality uh, of the Soviet Union was. Because if you take the other strand of our work, what we also had to do was come to grips with, if you want to use the phrase, the Russian uh, question. From our angle, we never thought uh, the idea that the Soviet Union was a worker state because it had nationalized X percent of uh, the means of production was a convincing uh, thesis. Uh, we never thought that uh, because in the Soviet Union property uh, was nationalized, that made it a worker state. And I know the argument would be that, uh, well, this was nationalized by a state that was the product of the October Revolution. We thought that in some sense, we were wrong, I hasten to add, uh, that uh, the communist parties uh, of Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union, we thought of these parties as being a bit like big versions of the CPGB. That's how we thought of them, right? That within these parties there will be healthy elements, within these parties there will be usses, within these parties there will be militant workers, within these parties there will be genuine communists. What we called for, um, faced with the uh, decline and uh, the 89-91 uh, period, we had no problem uh, in calling for what Trotsky said was a political revolution. The idea was that you get rid of the top bureaucracy, uh, you replace, sweep away uh, the parasites, and what you do is allow the, um, the proletarian base to assert itself. That was our idea. By 1991, it was quite clear that was a mistaken perspective. Uh, the Communist parties were not like uh, the CPGB. They were ruling parties. Uh, these parties were thoroughly part of the state. Uh, and certainly, from 1991, um, we took a complete reassessment uh, of what the Soviet Union was, and my own journey has taken me really uh, to Hillel's uh, position. I can remember reading Hillel's uh, critique number one um, and going, hmm, this actually uh, makes uh, sense. The idea that you have to study the Soviet Union not according to some preconceived category called a worker's state, let alone <coughs> state capitalism, which never made any sense to me, let alone some halfway house between the two called bureaucratic collectivism. The societies of uh, Eastern Europe and above all the Soviet Union had to be studied according to their own laws. That was the crucial uh, question. Okay, in the no minutes that I've got left, mm -hmm. in the no minutes I've got left, what I wanted to just deal with is our program. Because as a result of this theoretical work, both on the Soviet Union, both on the British Road to Socialism, and on a host of other political questions, right? Uh, what we did, I can't even remember when, uh, but we produced a draft program. And the reason why it's called a draft program is not because we, as this organization, intend finally to produce the real thing. We are extraordinarily conscious that we have the name CPGB, but we are not the CPGB. When the official CPGB formally liquidated in 1991, was it Congress House or do you want to remember where that was? Anyway, in central London, we had a giant banner saying, Communism lives. Right? That was our message. We took the name CPGB off the Euro communists as they closed down. But we were absolutely clear, we are not the Communist Party. A Communist Party is part of the class. It's the leading part of the class. And therefore, what we were putting forward to the left, and this is, this is why I think our struggle has significance, is we're also trying to put forward an answer for the left that shares many of our views, also for the left that doesn't share certain of our views, but actually wants the working class to become the ruling class, not only in this country, but on a global scale. In our view, we need to conduct our struggle for partyism, not for a sect, because it happens to think the same thing. 
we actually need a struggle that can embrace millions of people. That means developing a program, one that's practical, that can actually say these are the necessary steps that need to be taken if our class is going to come to power, but also a program that can unite the existing left within it on the basis not of some halfway house, not on the basis of reheated laborism, but on the basis of what we understand as the basic outlines of Marxism. That's the proposition uh, we put uh, forward. And the draft will remain a draft until it goes before a founding congress of a real party, all right? not a small group. We're in the process at the present time of redrafting our draft, and uh, I suspect there'll be some important changes compared with the first draft. That will go to a conference of this organization. But as I say, it will remain a draft until we become a party, or until we join a party or found a party. This program is based on the tradition of Marxism. Lars has written about the Russian program. Where does the Russian program come from? It was inspired by the German uh, program. Of course, we've all read uh, Engels's critique. We've all read Marx's uh, critique. Uh, we've read the Russian program. We're not trying to apply it artificially to these circumstances. What we're saying is that, that it's that sort of program that is needed. And therefore, what we've done is just like uh, the Germans, just like the Russians, just like the party of the workers in France that was drafted in, uh, was it Engels' front room in um, Regent's Park? <coughs> right, Marx said, uh, how about this as a program? We divide our program into two. We divide it into the immediate program, uh, and we divide it into the maximum program. The immediate program is about the proletariat coming to power. The immediate program. Minimum, immediate, it doesn't matter. It's the same thing, uh, Sam. The immediate program is about the working class coming to power. It's about what is technically feasible in this society. Right? But it's about the working class coming to power. It's about the working class making itself into a class. The maximum program is about the global reorganization uh, of society. It's about leaving behind the state. It's about leaving behind the nation. Right? It's about leaving behind class. It's, a, it's about leaving behind the division of labor. It's about human liberation. And what I would say that if I found one comrade on the face of uh, this planet that agreed with every phrase, every proposition, uh, every demand in it, I'll eat my hat. Right? I know that I will disagree with this or that aspect as it's voted through. And I'm sure that will apply to every other member of the CPGB. The crucial question that we're putting forward to the left is that we're not asking anyone to agree with it. We're asking people to accept it. We're asking people to say, when it says we're going to fight, for example, for a 35-hour week, that is something you're prepared to go on a demonstration for. If you're not prepared to go on a demonstration for that, okay. But that's all we are asking. This is the basis of unity in action. But we're breaking from the sterility that we see littered across the left of various leaders turning around and saying, I have produced you my latest uh, thoughts. It's as if they come from God himself. I am Moses, and I ask you to agree with everything. And if you don't agree with everything, you must agree with it in public. That is the attitude of a sect. It's not the attitude of a party. You cannot build a party of millions with that approach. You've got to have it on the basis of acceptance, and you've got to have it on the basis that when it comes to particular details, important details even, these differences can be fought out like scientists fighting it out in front of the public to educate our class in the sort of program and the politics it needs in order to become a ruling class. If you don't have that sort of approach, quite frankly, then we go back to the sort of socialisms 
that Marx critiqued in the Communist Manifesto. Educative dictatorships. We know best, we're the clever guys, we're the elite, we're going to liberate you, you don't have any democracy, but we are going to raise you up from the shackles of capitalism, and sometime in the future maybe you'll be um, clever enough uh, to do things your own way. That is a patronising and deeply anti-Marxist uh, attitude. So, 30 years, they've been difficult 30 years. 30 years, I cannot look back at 30 years and say everything we said is uh, wonderful. Uh, lots of things we said were shit or mistaken, that's absolutely true. But 30 years, 30 worthwhile years, not just in terms of my personal uh, self-fulfillment, but I think that in terms of 30 years, what is called the CPGB today has actually done a service for the entire uh, left. And we view the drafting of our programme and the work that we're conducting for a Marxist party, but not only something for this organisation to engage in, but anybody who's a sincere left winger, a sincere partisan of the working class, ought to be engaging in this process, in this battle. Thank you, comrades.